thanks to uh, the massive crowd that is gathered uh, in front of me, for those of you that are watching, uh, thousands of people here at uh, 7 in the morning uh, in Las Vegas. Thank you for coming. Those of you that got up or those of you that are just rolling in after a great evening uh, in Vegas, I appreciate it. Um, so what I want to talk with you about uh, today, let's see if we can get this um, going. So technically, <laughs> That's right. This is the shakedown run. They always have me. This is just an experiment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll get rid of, so that's, uh, that's me. What I wanted to talk to you about this morning is a, an initiative that, that uh, we've been working on for about two or three years, and we're calling it the future of HR. I called this session the profession formerly known as HR. That's not because we, so much that we need to rename it, but because I've been privileged to work with a group of about 30 chief HR officers from some of the leading organizations in the world, I'll talk more about that in a minute, as well as thought leaders, and they're looking ahead about 10 years, and we're doing that together and what we're finding suggests that this profession we see today is going to look extremely different in as soon as about 10 years. And it may even need to be called something different. It's certainly going to have to be uh, defined and bounded in different ways. This journey for me began with some discussions with uh, colleagues of mine. Many of them were, uh, for example, the chief HR officer of everything from Gap to Unilever to IBM. And I'm not name dropping, but just to give you an idea of the range of organizations to uh, early stage organizations in Silicon Valley, Electronic Arts, Juniper Networks. And people started coming to me. Uh, for example, Scott Petaskey, now the head of HR at Starbucks, and said, There's, we, need to, we need to talk about the future of this profession, John. And I said, well, I think a lot of us have been talking about that future for a while, and I think the progress the profession is making is steady, uh, but very encouraging. And they said, yeah, we get that, and we agree, and some of the work that we're doing is contributing to that. But they started to draw a curve that looked like this. And they said, the potential for this profession, and really the requirements of this profession, by the year 2025 are going to accelerate so much that if we just stay on the track we're on, we're going to have a gap that will be too big to surmount. And some other professions may take this on. Our profession may not be ready to do it. And so they said, we're, you know, if this is about now, we're kind of at a tipping point, And we need to accelerate the progress of the profession to reach the level that we need to be. Now, this is a bit of art that shows a bunch of people at campfires. The other thing they said was, we need to work better together. Each of us, a number of these CHROs are obviously exemplary, and their organizations are exemplary. And so they said, you know, we are making progress in our own organization, and it's like one campfire. And the people around our campfire are well-fed, and they're warm, and there's another campfire over here at this organization, and another one over here at this organization, but we're all doing it separately. And it doesn't come together as a collective bonfire to really move this profession and its capabilities beyond what each organization is doing. There's a lot of, of duplication. And, and so they, they committed, this is a very interesting gathering of folks, they committed to volunteer their time and create a collective place where we could work at, at, with open source values and with the idea of playing together in the middle to get things done that we couldn't do separately. We, we took a year, and uh, I, along with uh, Andrew Schmidt uh, from the Society for HR Management, did interviews of these 30 people. We brought them together for a summit, and we said, how would we define the big areas that we need to work on to make this tipping point happen? And these are those four areas. The charter for the profession, how does the profession contribute to success? The expectations of our constituents, because this can't all be just about us. It's actually got to be pulled from others the tools and operating models that we use, and then finally, the talent pipeline. And how are we going to create the talent, either within HR or outside, that's ready to do this? And I'll talk about each of those with you. My favorite story on the charter is I was talking with a CHRO who said, three of us got together and we were going to teach a class, three CHROs. Each of us had our own model of how HR contributes to business success. One had five arrows, one had three circles, et cetera, right? 
And they said, you know, we ought to put these things together. There's probably some underlying logic to them so that we can teach the class in an organized way. And he said, we couldn't agree. So we ended up teaching each of our models. And we confused everybody. And, in a w and so that's one issue here, is unlike marketing, finance, and other disciplines, uh, which have a better sense of the logic that says, if you invest in this profession here, this is how it affects the organization. So that was point one. The other point was, can we create that logic and then apply it to the year 2025? So one of the teams actually took on the idea of saying, if we think about uh, societal and context trends, and then we think about how those trends are going to affect the organization, we think about what capabilities it needs, and that tells us something about the people and HR. And you'll see that theme resonating through this. So the team came up with this set of themes for the year 2025. I'm not going to go through them in great detail, but the idea was we're going to see massive social and organization reconfiguration. The idea that your organization is boundaryless, that everybody can see inside, that everybody inside can see outside. The notion that political organizations are being reformed, Arab Spring instead of long-term governments, etc. That leads to number two. The, impl the implication for the world of work is you'll have an all-inclusive talent market. You'll get work from anywhere, and you'll send work anywhere. It, it won't just be employees. This is the subject of a book that's coming out next month that I wrote with Robin J. Suthasen and David Creelman. The idea that employment is only one way to get work done. Freelancers, borrowed employees, outsourcers, contractors, there's an interconnected world out there that organizations are going to need to master. So a truly connected world, the internet of everything, lots of data in the cloud, the ability to track everything from your medical records to what your appliances are doing to how your car is running to everything about how people are doing their work in the workplace. Number four is an, that, that's supported by technology, an exponential pattern of change a cloud that is bigger and richer and more searchable every single day. The ability to send massive amounts of data about more and more stuff to that cloud. Some people are talking about uploading most of your consciousness to the cloud by 2030. So your kids can interact with you long after you're gone on an app, basically. Now, I don't know if that'll happen, but it does get to the, the implication for people, the idea of human and machine collaboration. Not as simple as will robots take jobs or will algorithms take jobs, but a much more nuanced idea. How do we get people working with the algorithms? Doctors, for example, working with IBM's Watson, with Watson reading the literature and the doctors listening to Watson tell them what do the findings seem to be. So again, this future of HR then has maybe two dimensions. Future of organizations, rather. Democratization of work, that is work from anywhere to anywhere, work based on ratings, your organization is rated by your workers, and, and then technological empowerment. And the idea at this point is, not all organizations will be the same. They won't all be affected equally, but you could plot yourself on these two dimensions. Are you low on both? Are you high on both? Are you high on one, low on the other, etc.? That led us to think about what are the expectations then of our constituents? And I was fortunate enough, we're working with the National Academy of Human Resources, as well as, as I said, the uh, Human Resources People and Strategy arm of SHRM. And so we had access to CEOs, board members, investors, et cetera. And my favorite story here was of the CHRO of a very big company. And he said, the day I arrived, my CEO was introducing people in, in the different functions. And he said, here's our marketing leader. This is what they're going to do to help us succeed. And he had a very eloquent uh, eloquent co uh, comment. Here's our finance leader, and this is what they're going to do to help us succeed. And, they, um, and then he came to HR, and he said, here's HR, and this is, and he scratched his head just like this. And he said, why don't you tell us what you're going to do to help us succeed? The idea is, it's a funny story, but it got a lot of nods around the head, and these are some of the CHROs that are the best in the world at what they do. So even there, this idea that constituents need some help, they need to help, help articulating what it is that HR does and how it does it. So one of our teams went out and interviewed about 30 uh, C CEOs and others from, again, this wide range of companies ranging from Procter & Gamble to uh, Gap to Electronic Arts, uh, et cetera. And I won't go through this in detail, but the scorecard that they came up with basically said what we see in our research at the Center for Effective Organizations, that HR is good on the traditional things, consultative skills, partnering and engaging with senior leaders, managing the workforce. 
But these CEOs, number one, they said, those trends you put up there, that idea of democratiz democratization and the idea of technological empowerment, those are real. We think about those a lot. And they said, you know what I'd love? is a function that was the COO of culture. What I'd really love is somebody who could lead a function called change and innovation. And I love my HR leader. I've worked with the some of the best HR leaders in the world, said these CEOs. But there are some things on the horizon, and I don't know where they fit in my leadership team. I need somebody who can work in the white spaces between my leadership functions. I need somebody who can work in the white spaces between us and all those organizations that are at the same time our competitors and our partners and the place where we get and borrow workers. So, so they love HR, this constituency group, investors, CEOs, et cetera. But they also said, if I look ahead and I agree with you on these trends, I'm not sure we have a profession that's ready for that. And I'd love it to be HR. I hope it is, but I'm not sure it's getting there. One of the teams then came up with this representation of the organization capabilities that will be needed. We'll still have planning, attracting, aligning, engaging, and operational excellence. Those will still exist, but they'll change. Planning, rather than being, you know, forecasting out gaps and filling them, will be much more about change leadership about being the profession that understands change, constant change. That's something that my colleagues Chris Worley, Ed Lawler, and Sue Mormon write about. The notion that agility means always changing. Not just trend forecasting, but leading the change. Not just attracting talent to be employees, but being ready to source talent from wherever it exists and on whatever platform it exists. Building communities way before we ever employ workers and being the preferred part of that community. Organization and performance architecture. Yes, we're going to still align people around goals and around performance, et cetera, but it's going to be much more than performance rating, goal setting, succession planning. It's going to be about constantly creating the architecture of an organization and constantly aligning people with that. Increasingly engaging them with a sense of purpose, which means not employee engagement, not just engagement surveys, those, those will still exist, but how is the world engaging with us? And what is our purpose beyond just the financials? And do we present that purpose to the community in a way that makes sense to them. The other part is being an activist. There are social policies that absolutely must change if we're going to live in a world where talent can come from anywhere to anywhere. And those, those policies, things like benefits, things like pensions, things like health care, this whole uber-empowered world, um, those things require an infrastructure that is, that's going to need to be led by activists. And then operational excellence. The CEOs said something like, I'd like to see HR put anything that can be on an app on an app and, and get it into the hands of our employees and get it into the hands of our leaders and get on with this other stuff that is significantly important. So we think about then the third, the third, uh, uh, the third theme of this project, rewiring HR. The idea of this one was people said, you know, each of us is building uh, operating models, each of us is building tools, our uh, technology vendors and organizations are, bu are building tools, but they don't always come together. It's like each of us is inventing the rewiring diagram. So they began to think about what would that operating model look like, and this, this is work that is just beginning. But the team came up with this as the beginning for their profession, perhaps to begin to think about it. Yes, we can deliver the work of, let's call it HR, but what I mean is this work of talent and community building and organization architecture. We can deliver that work through something we call an HR function. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of putting a big fence around that and saying, you can't play here unless you have uh, perhaps certain certifications, et cetera. I'm part of the certification board for SHRM. I'm all for certifications, but not so much as a boundary, but as an invitation. Because we can think about the second way of delivering HR's work. The team called it resourcing. I've called it retooling HR. The idea that other disciplines, like marketing, finance, operations, have got unbelievably useful expertise for doing the things that we do. Talent sourcing and deployment looks a lot like a supply chain. Should we be using the supply chain experts in our organization to help with that? Procurement is already doing a lot of the freelancing, outsourcing, et cetera, of talent. Should we get them good enough at talent that they can, they can be even more complete? Crowdsourcing. How much of this can be done by the crowd? 
We already see crowdsourced performance ratings. We, we see crowdsourced recruiting, where you let the social network find people for you. We see crowdsourced mentoring, where you find mentors for your people outside your organizational boundary on a platform where people come together. Automating, I talked about the people-human interface. The CEO said, we'd like to see HR lead on showing us how people and algorithms work together. All of you are aware, lots of press around Google's ability to predict that you're going to want to leave before you even know you're going to want to leave. Uh, lots of algorithms to predict who might be the best hire. That's only going to increase. There's, there are such immense opportunities for big data to help with that kind of prediction. The trick is how much should be automated and how much should be in partnership with people. Can we put artificial intelligence in the hands of frontline managers when they're having a tough discussion with an employee, when they're hiring an employee, when they need to think about their leadership, et cetera? We already have tools that sort of automate the forms, automate the processes. Can we get more sophisticated about how humans interact with the technology, with the algorithms in a seamless way to do this stuff that we do to make organization and people great? And then finally, outsourcing getting open to the idea that it doesn't all have to happen inside your organization. A good example is healthcare exchanges being created now by a number of consulting firms. Those healthcare exchanges really change the role of what we call benefits in organizations. Uh, it's a very different role. It means that a lot of things don't happen inside that used to happen inside. So you can see, again, just like the migration model that had democracy and technology, the teams are suggesting this might be a way for us to begin a dialogue that would talk about how we get the work done in different ways. And then finally, the talent pipeline. This, I have a very, this, this is meant to show a kind of broken or unconstructed pipeline for talent here. My story on this one is I talked to several CHROs. These are people who are doing dream jobs in big companies. And they said, my child just graduated from school. And they asked me what profession to go into to change the world. I see someone nodding, maybe you know where I'm going. And they said, I'm not sure I can recommend HR. And I said, but you're living the dream. How can you not recommend HR? I mean, you are what they want to become. And they said two things. They said, I got here largely by chance. It was because a manager happened to let me run a business once. It was because I happened to get this global opportunity. I'm not sure the pipeline of talent in HR always gets the best person to the job they should be in. And the other one was, I'm not sure the best HR work they can do won't start with them as an engineer or won't start with them as a marketer. Because when I think about total rewards, John, I think about a product that we are, that we are creating for a segmented group of employees and, custom, and customers and isn't marketing where I would look for that. So this is, these are some of the, the beginnings of ideas that these teams came up with as they talked to the CHROs, et cetera, about the roles that we might look forward to a virtual culture architect, a global talent scout convener and coach, the master of the social world of work, an activist for social policy, an integrator of data and people, not just an analyst, and an organizational engineer that is like an engineer and knows that much about the principles of organization that they can constantly keep the organization changing in the right direction. As you can see, this doesn't quite look like the usual HR competency model. It doesn't look like something that we today call HR, and that's why I titled the session the profession formerly known as HR, that may, may have as much marketing, as much engineering, as much social activism in it as it does the traditional areas that we see. And so in the next phase, we plan to engage people like you if we can. These four product lines, we're building a laboratory to rapid prototype tools, we're going to build a platform that, that allows you to interact with the work that we've done uh, and, to, and to help us with conversations, blogs, et cetera. And we're going to deploy this to accepted practice with organizations like uh, Human Resources People and Strategy, the Society for HR Management, National Academy of Human Resources, to get these new ideas out in the field as accepted practice. So I am enthusiastic, optimistic, excited, about the future of HR and the future that all of you have. I'm also here to say it looks like it's going to be very different from what we see today, and that's a good thing. Thank you very much for your attention this morning.